What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. It's one of my favorite uh, hymns of old, and it's called What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And it's so true that we often forfeit so many things. We forfeit peace. We forfeit seeing God move. We forfeit so many things, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Today, I want to talk to you about three keys for essential prayer, uh, for effective prayer, and for fruitful prayer. Um, these three keys are biblical, and these are three things that the Bible talks about for how you can pray according to the Bible um, for that prayer to be more effective. What do I mean by more effective? Well, think of it like this. Um, if I have my weed whacker, and I have my weed whacker, I'm a landscaper, so I actually have it right next to my uh, shed here. If I have my weed whacker, it takes a certain type of mix, and that mix has to be the proper amount. It has to have the two cycle engine oil, um, it has to have two gallons of gasoline and two of those <coughs> um, engine mixes, or sorry, uh, one of those two gallon engine mixes. And actually the gasoline turns like a bluish color, I put it in, and the engine starts right up. But if I just put straight gasoline into my weed whacker, it would not work. And so you need the right mix, and once the mix is right, um, the weed whacker functions. And in a similar way, uh, for prayer to function, God has put prayer into um, something he's told us to do, but for it to work well, uh, we need to do it according to how God's prescribed it. We have to put the right mix, we have to put the right dose, we have to uh, pray according to these three keys if we want to see God uh, answer our prayers. And the truth is, is God can actually work even if we do put the wrong mix in. That's the cool part about God, is that... Um, you know, these principles are true, but sometimes God will still answer the prayer, you know, the prayer of someone who is just desperately crying out to God and, you know, they're not praying according to um, <laughs> um, the word of God and they're not following necessarily these principles. Uh, just because God's gracious, the Bible even says that he, he, um, he feeds the ravens when they call. So even um, sometimes he'll even answer prayers of people that are not <laughs> um, Christians. Um, and because God is just gracious, you know, and he's trying to reveal himself to them. So, but there's a better way to pray. And there's, a, there's a way that Jesus taught us to pray. And the more we fall in line with that, uh, the better. So first of all, I want to ask this question uh, to you guys. Why pray? Why actually pray? Okay. Why should we pray? We should pray namely to know God. Okay. Prayer is a means of getting to know our creator, getting <coughs> to know God. <coughs> prayer helps us build our relationship with God. That's the first thing we need to know is that prayer is for our relationship with God. Prayer also changes you. Prayer does something. It's not always just about the answer. It's about the change that you go through while you pray. Because you're learning to surrender your desires to him. You're learning to connect to him. And when you get into his presence, prayer brings you into his presence. When you get into his presence, his presence begins to transform you and make you look more like him. Yes, John Feldbauer said, communicating with our father. Yes, prayer is all about communication. In the same way that communication on a human level, if I have a friend, I want to communicate with them, right? There's really two main ways to communicate with a friend if I want to build a closer friendship. The two ways to communicate is I want to talk to that friend. So I want to tell him what's on my heart, my ideas, my thoughts, so that he gets to know who I am. And then I want to listen to his thoughts. I want to listen to what he has to say. And so it's a two-way, communication is always a two-way street. And so the Bible tells us that if we want to communicate with God, the two main ways that we communicate with our Creator, with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, is we, number one, we have to hear from him. We have to hear the word of God, listen to it, heed it, because that's how God speaks to us. Secondly, we have to pray to him. We have to talk to him because that's how we speak to God. So praying is how we speak to God and reading the word is how God speaks to us. So reading the Bible and praying every single day, 
read your Bible and pray. We used to, I used to um, remember when I was a little kid in church, um, you know, we used to sing this song. It said, read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, 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 and you'll grow, grow, grow. And then we would like grow. We would like stand a little taller as you're saying grow, grow, grow. But man, I just remember that as a kid. Read your Bible and pray every day and you will grow. That's a promise, that's a guarantee because you're communicating with God when you're doing those two things. Sometimes people say, what's more important? Should I read the Bible more or should I pray more? What's, what should I really do more? And here's what Charles Spurgeon said when someone asked him the same question. What's more important, Bible or prayer? He said, he said back, and I love this response. What's more important? Breathing in or breathing out? Amen. <laughs> you, can't, you can't have one without the other. It's like having peanut butter with no jelly. It's like having, um, you know, bread with no butter. It's like having, you know, whatever the two things you, milk with no chocolate, no chocolate milk. I don't know, chocolate syrup. I don't know. Whatever combo you want to look like, you can't separate these two things. Okay. Why should we pray? Also, we should pray because it brings us closer to God. But we should also pray because it's a command from God in the Bible. And the Bible calls us to obey Jesus' commands because Jesus is Lord. So here's some commands um, that teach us to pray. So 1 Thessalonians 5.17 uh, tells us to pray without ceasing. Okay, to pray without stopping, without ceasing. Okay, Romans 12.12 says, Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation. And then it says, be constant in prayer. Romans 12.12 12 says, be constant in prayer. Philippians 4, 6 says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So it says, don't be anxious about anything, but pray about everything. James 5 says, Elijah was a man just like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. For three years, it didn't rain on the earth, and then he prayed again, and it rained. And then it says, the fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man avails much or has great power in its working. So James talks about the example of Elijah. He was just a man just like us. He was a man with a nature like ours. He wasn't some superhero, super person. He was a man just like us, but he prayed and he saw God move because he prayed, okay? So prayer is all about relationship. Prayer is about the Bible commands us to pray, but prayer is also about answered prayer, okay? The reason God tells us to pray is so that we would receive, okay? The Bible says you have not because you ask not. God wants us to pray for a relationship, but he also, he loves to answer our prayers. He's a good father who loves to give good gifts to his children. And he wants us to call upon his name. The Bible says, call upon you, call upon me, Jeremiah 33, 3, call upon me and I will answer you and I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. So Jeremiah 33 Three, you can remember that, 333, three, three, okay? 33 is actually my favorite number, fun fact. Jeremiah 33.3, 3, it says that if you call upon him, he's going to answer you, okay? So prayer is also about, you know, God does want us to pursue uh, the answers to our prayer, okay? The ways that God answers our prayer are threefold. Number one, he can say yes, he can answer that prayer, okay? Number two, he can say no. He can say no. I'm sorry. I, that's that prayer is not according to my will right now. Or number three, he can say wait. So yes, no, or wait. Those are the three ways God responds to prayer. A lot of us might be in the waiting season where we're praying for things. You don't. You haven't heard a yes yet. You haven't really had a rejection or a no. The door hasn't shut. It's just a waiting season. And in those waiting seasons, we want to keep on praying. Okay. So now I want to give you the three keys for effective prayer. This is very biblical. Um, with every key, I'm gonna give you scripture. Uh, and these are keys that are from the Bible, okay? And the reason I uh, wanted to do a message on this is we've been in John 15 for three sessions now. Um, last session, we talked about um, the love of God. The session before that, we talked about the pruning process. And the session before that, um, for the new year, we talked about abiding in Christ, okay? But in John 15, uh, verse 7, it says this, and this is what really sparked my interest. It says, if you abide in me 
and my words abide in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. So Jesus tells us that we can ask whatever we wish, and it will be done for us, on the condition, on the condition <coughs> that his words are our first abiding in us. So the first key, remember I'm going to give you three keys for effective prayer. The first key for effective prayer, according to the scriptures, is that your prayers have to be word-centered. Okay, someone comment that in the chat, please. Someone comment in the chat. My prayers have to be word-centered. 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 I'll say it again. Word-centered so you don't forget it. Because if we're praying according to the Word of God, we're praying according to the will of God. The Word of God reveals the will of God for us. So if I go out and I pray and I say, Lord, send me a Lamborghini, okay? If that's not God's will, he's not going to do it. <laughs> that's just a selfish prayer because I want to have a cool car so I could show it off, right? But if I said, Lord, God, would you, would you help me to grow more patient today? I think God's more likely to answer the patient prayer than the Lambo prayer because that prayer of patience is according to the Bible. It's according to the fruits of the Spirit. And now, honestly, I believe God could send a Lamborghini. Like, if you know, if, if you want to use it for his kingdom and, you know, the Bible says he loves to give good gifts, but, you know, it's very highly unlikely that God's going to do that. Uh, he wants to, um, he, he wants to answer your prayer so that you, if, if it's something that will benefit you spiritually, okay, something that will grow you. Um, Carmela, uh, you said you can't pray for material things. I would actually kind of challenge, or um, I would say, you can pray for material things. I don't think that's a bad thing to do. Um, for example, if it's to benefit just yourself, then I, I wouldn't pray for material things. But if it's a material thing that is for God's kingdom, like you, you should pray for that because uh, there's people that have prayed, God, would you send me um, money so I can have a house, so I can use that house to show hospitality to people that so I can have a Bible study in my house. Lord, could you could you send me, you know, um, I don't know, better supplies for my kitchen so I can cook, so I can feed the homeless, right? God's, God's probably going to love to answer that prayer because you're using it for his kingdom. So yeah, I think I understood what you meant. Just wanted to clarify for others that might have saw the comment and said, oh, I can't pray for material things. You can, but it has to be for the kingdom. It has to be a kingdom thing, okay? Um, so <clears throat> Proverbs 28.9 says, he that turns his ear away from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination to the Lord. Wow, that's intense. Proverbs 28, 9 says this, he that turneth his ear, he turns his ear from hearing the law. He, he sees the law, he sees the word of God. The law simply just means the word of God. And it's someone that sees the word of God and they just turn their ear and they, they, they go like this to the word. They shut it out. They say, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to go to church. I don't want to read the Bible. I don't, I don't want to hear these instructions. I want to live on my own. Okay. God says, if someone turns his ear away from hearing the law, his prayer is counted as an abomination. An abomination, um, when I think of abomination, you know what I think of? I think of the abominable snowman from, uh, what's that movie? The Heat Miser or whatever. I don't know. If anyone knows that movie, maybe you can put it in the comments. But the abominable snowman. I don't even know what abominable snowman or i don't know fully what abominable means but i think it means it's it's um it's just horrendous uh abominable means it's just it, it's it's horrendous to the it's it's something that's totally a, a a turn off like it's it's his prayer is is offensive that's i think that's a good way to put it if someone ignores the word of god his prayers become offensive to the lord why because those prayers He's trying to talk to God. He's trying to get things from God, but he's not willing to submit to the instructions that God gave us, okay? So John, here's the scriptures I'm using. John 15, seven through nine says, if my words abide in you, then ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Why does that work? Because when you're in the word of God, you're, 
your heart is being aligned with the will of God. So now the things you're asking for, if you're submissive to this book, are not going to be for Lamborghinis. They're going to be for the things of the kingdom of God. They're going to be for the things of the word of God and the will of God. So now God's inclined to answer the prayers because you're praying and you're speaking his language. Um, if we pray the scriptures, God is bound to his word, right? The Bible is, is God's word and we can claim these promises and stand on these promises. If we're not praying according to the scripture, then what are we standing on? Our own heart, our own deceitful heart, our own will? You see, we need to stand on what God has said and we have to take him at his word, okay? Verse number three is uh, 1 John five thirteen. First 1 John five thirteen that says this, I write these things <coughs> to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we know that he hears us in whatever we ask. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we've asked of him. Amen. So it says this, that we have confidence towards God. The Bible says this is the confidence we have towards him. The Bible also talks about in the book of Hebrews that we should approach the throne of grace with boldness. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Um, Tracy, that was 1 John 5, 13 through 15. 1 John 5, 13 through 15. So it says this is the confidence that we have towards him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So the Bible says we need to be asking for things in his will. Like Jesus prayed in the garden of Gethsemane. Father, not my will, but thy will be done. Lord, if it's possible, take this cup. Nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. Jesus taught us in the Lord's prayer to say, um, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is. Right? We want to pray according to his will. And the Bible says, if we pray according to his will, we have a confidence in coming to him. And we know that he hears us. And if we know he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request we've asked of him. Basically, that's a, a certain way of simp simply saying that, um, <clears throat> that if you ask, right, if you ask according to his will, you can have a total confidence that God is inclined to answer that prayer because it's his will. Okay, so this is the first key. And uh, John, that's so cool that you commented Mark 11 because I'm actually going to touch on that verse very soon. So I actually have that in my notes. So no coincidence there. But um, John 15, 7 through 9, Proverbs 28, verse 9, and 1 John 5, 13 all tell us that the power of prayer comes when our prayers are centered on the word of God. Are you in the word of God today? If you're watching this, do you read the word? Are you invested in this book? Or is this book just something that you maybe have a, a couple minute devotional and then you just put it to the side the rest of your, the rest of your day and, and kind of check it off a list? Or is this book something that you hunger and thirst for? Something that you're meditating on day and night? Because I want to tell you, if you meditate on this book day and night, it's going to affect and bless your prayer life. Okay, it's going to help you to pray more. Especially it's going to help you to know God more because you're going to know his heart. Okay? Amen. So the second principle, so the first principle is our prayers should be word-centered. The second principle is that we must not give up on praying. We must not grow weary. We must not give up. We must not slow down. We must not stop praying. We have to have our prayers be persistent. We have to be persistently coming to God. Okay, there's a power in persistence. Matthew chapter 7 says this. This is where Jesus taught us on the power of persistence in seeking the things of God and seeking to pray. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus taught us the Lord's Prayer and he taught us um, things about prayer in Matthew 6. But in Matthew 7, he said this, Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened unto you. 
For everyone who asks, receives, everyone who seeks, finds, and everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. And then he says, what father among you, if your son asks him for a fish, will instead give him a serpent? Or what father, if your son asks for a piece of bread, will give him a stone? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit and give good gifts to those who ask him? Okay, Jesus is saying, first of all, let's break it down. He's saying, ask and you will receive. I believe that that shows us kind of level one to praying, asking and receiving. Okay, Lord, help me with this and you will receive. But then level two it steps up a little bit. So there's asking and receiving, then there's seeking and finding. Ask and you will receive. Okay, that's kind of like, for example, if, if I wanted something from my dad, right? Maybe he's upstairs in his room and I say, dad, can you help me with something with my car? It broke down outside. Dad, and he doesn't hear me in his room. That's asking, that's like step one, just shouting from, from the living room to the basement. Dad, can you help me? He doesn't hear me. So then I've got to go to step two. If dad is not answering me, he's not hearing me, you know what I got to do? I got to go seek him out. I got to walk up the steps and get closer to where he is so that he can hear me. Dad, my car broke down. Can you help me? Still no answer. I'm seeking. Okay, third step. I knock on the door. And then he opens the door. He's, he wakes up and he says, or he takes his headphones off. He says, what, Jess? And I said, dad, my, my car broke down. Can you help me? Do you see how... I didn't give up in that analogy and then my dad opened the door finally and was able to help me. Imagine if I just gave up and I said, dad, my car broke down, can you help me? And I didn't get an answer from my, my earthly father and I just said, oh man, uh, you know, I guess, I, guess I, I guess I quit, right? The thing is a lot of people do that with our time with God, with our prayers with God. We pray one time and say, God, will you do this? Will you save my family member? Um, and it doesn't happen, then we just quit, right? God, would you just bring healing to this pain uh, that I'm going through, um, this pain in my heart, this pain in my body, whatever, and then we just quit. Or, or God, would you just help me, um, Lord, to um, just be more bold in my faith. God, I want to be more bold in my faith. And God doesn't answer. You see, I'm done. I quit. I quit praying. See, that's a sign um, that, you know, that we're not being persistent. And that, that shows that we need, to, we, need to, we need to step it up there. We can't be giving up. And there's also a time to stop praying. And I do believe in this. There is a time where God will give us a peace where we don't need to keep praying about something uh, as, as fervently, as consistently, because God's given us a restful peace about it. Okay, for example, uh, when you think about Paul with the thorn in the flesh, he pleaded with the Lord, take this away from me. But God spoke to him and said, my grace is sufficient for you. And so Paul was able to have a restful peace knowing that, okay, I don't need to keep on crying out to God about this because God already spoke to me and he knows that, that he's using this for my good, okay? So sometimes God will give us a peace, but most of the time God wants us to keep on persisting. He wants us to keep on asking, level one, seeking, number two, and knocking, number three, okay? Do you see those levels of persistence in that analogy I shared about my dad? Okay, we've gotta be persistent. It's not just asking, it's seeking and knocking. Okay, what are you knocking for? What are you seeking for this year, 2024? What do you keep on coming to God with? Okay, Kathy commented, wrestling with God like Jacob. That's a great analogy. That's a perfect analogy, exactly. Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. He, he took a hold of him and said, God, God, I will not let you go. Yes, Linda said, God doesn't always heal on this side of heaven. We have to trust him. I me amen. I, I love to preach that. And I love to talk about that because there's certain people out there that says, oh, if you have enough faith, God will heal you. I don't believe that's necessarily true. I believe that sickness and pain is, is part of God. He uses that for his glory. And, you know, if, if everyone was supposed to be healed, then, you know, we wouldn't need heaven, right? People would never die <laughs> because ultimately people die, um, you know, I believe God is a miracle worker. He's a healer. But to say that God always has to heal, um, yeah, I don't necessarily agree with that. So we're we'll keep going. Um, another passage of persistence is Luke chapter 18. Okay. In Luke chapter 18, um, it's the parable of the persistent widow. So Luke chapter 18 is the parable of the persistent widow. I'm just going to summarize it for the sake of time, but there's a widow 
that keeps coming to an unjust judge and says, give me justice. And the unjust judge says no. But the widow is so desperate that she keeps on knocking. She keeps on begging. She keeps on coming to the judge and saying, please give me justice. Please give me justice. Please give me justice. And the judge keeps on saying no. But eventually he says, because this widow keeps bothering me, irritating me with her continual coming, I'm going to give her what she asks so that she stops bothering me. And she gets the justice. And then God says, how much more will God give justice to his own children who cry to him day and night? You see, the analogy that Luke 18 makes is that if a widow is able to get justice by persistence from an unjust judge, how much more are God's children going to receive answers to prayer from a father in heaven who's not unjust, who's just, and who loves his kids? So it's using an an argument from the lesser to the greater. So if God's able to, if in the human realm, if how things work in life, you can get things by persistence, right? Even little kids, right? They keep begging for something and the parent just gets annoyed and they finally give in. Maybe you're that parent. Maybe you're, you know what I'm talking about. Maybe you've given in before when your kids just keep begging you for something. Or maybe you've been that kid and maybe you're still doing it to your, your parents. I don't know, but right. Um, sometimes you can even keep begging and eventually someone's going to give you something, right? Because you're just annoying them at this point. And God's saying, if that works in a human level, how much more does God want to bless his kids as a heavenly father? Um, and, and Jesus talks about how that persistence, it actually has power as well in the spiritual realm. It has power with God when we keep on persisting. It's not like God gets bothered by us, though. That's one thing I want to say. God never gets bothered by our uh, continual coming to him. He actually wants us to come to him and he tests us sometimes by making us wait so that we would learn to keep on coming to him. The third key. So the first key is our prayers have to be word centered. The second key is our prayers have to be, we have to persist in our prayers. The third key to effective prayer is we must have faith in what we pray for. We cannot just be praying and not expecting God to answer. Faith is so important. So in James chapter one, um, it talks about asking God for wisdom, but it says, let him ask in faith for the one who doubts is like a double minded man, unstable in all his ways. Such a person must suppose, must, must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's like a wave tossed to the sea. He's double minded. And if he's asking, but he doesn't believe, God's saying he's not going to receive anything from the Lord. Okay, James 1 makes it clear that doubting um, can diminish the answers of prayer. Okay, Um, Mark chapter 11, verse 24 says, and this is the passage that um, John Feldbauer already commented. Jesus told us, he said, when you pray, when you stand praying, believe that you've already received it and it will be yours. He says, when you pray, believe you've already received it. Believe that God's already answered it, if it's a prayer, according to his will, and it will be yours. So it, instead of just, when you pray about something, thank God for the answer to that prayer. Sometimes it's powerful. Uh, Lord, I thank you for strength for today. Lord, I'm not, I'm not begging you for something. I'm thanking you because I already know you're going to give me strength. Father, I thank you for opening my eyes. When I read the word, I thank you that I'm going to understand. Uh, You're going to give me spiritual understanding uh, to comprehend your word. I'm thanking him because I'm believing that he's already answered that prayer. Um, Start thanking him for the blessing in advance. Okay, it's not some magic formula by saying some magic words that change things, but it's it's trying to teach yourself to to be open to uh, receiving and, and expecting an answer. Because we need to be expectant when we pray. So thanking God for the answer is always a powerful thing to do. Uh, Matthew thirteen fifty eight talks about uh, something else. It says this. Jesus could do no mighty miracles in that city because of their unbelief. You see, this verse always shocked me. Because Jesus, 
he's like has the greatest faith in the world right he he could do he he healed so many people he did so many miracles he went from town to town and, and people were just getting touched by him in certain towns it says he healed everyone in the city uh, or everyone that came to him at least and it said that some towns he came to he could do no mighty miracles there why because of the people's unbelief because the people were so hard-hearted and doubted and doubting god jesus himself he could not it actually limited jesus and that's a crazy thought how could jesus be limited it says that jesus could not do it, he was unable to do mighty miracles because of the people's unbelief in him you know what that means like exact for example like god can do anything right he can do anything he's almighty but people that reject him they limit the power of god in their lives they limit the miracles they limit the the experiences that they could have with god because they just stop believing they stop believing that god cares about them they stop believing that god loves them and guess what how are you going to receive god's love if you if you're rejecting him you see god's a gentleman right he's he he knocks at the door and he waits and um you know he can you know, sometimes people say God doesn't force himself on anyone. I don't know if I necessarily agree with that because, you know, God can do anything he wants. And if he wants to force himself on someone like the Apostle Paul, he, he pretty much forced himself on Paul. He blinded him and knocked him off a horse. Um, so he can he can do that. But I do understand that there is an aspect, though, that God, he rather he would rather you open yourself up to him. He would rather you want to be with him. OK, one more verse I'll share. Uh is Matthew 17 20 and it says faith like a must if you had faith like a mustard seed you could say to this mountain be thrown into the sea and it will obey you okay so Jesus talks about uh, faith like a mustard seed faith like a mustard seed even little faith can move a mountain even little faith can move a mountain so when I talk about faith I don't want you to leave discouraged and be like oh man I just always doubt I have weak faith I, uh, I can't do it I don't seem to have faith like other people I, I feel like I'm always doubting I feel like I'm always questioning I'm not sure about things well here's the encouraging news here's the good news here's look I got the good news Bible right here good news this is good news from the Bible right here for you if you have faith just like a mustard seed God can work with that the mustard seed is the smallest seed it's the smallest plant at the time and and what jesus was saying let's look if even if you've just got this little faith this little faith god can use it god can use little faith be encouraged be encouraged if you feel like you have little faith you know um the mustard seed can do big things it can even move a mountain there's another story in the book of mark where someone was doubting jesus and said lord i believe but help my unbelief maybe you're here today and you're saying lord i believe Lord, help my unbelief. That's a beautiful prayer to pray if you want to grow your faith. Say, Lord, I believe, but right now I have unbelief. Confess that unbelief to the Lord because he can work with that. Just say, help me, help my unbelief, help my unbelief. I believe and just press into the Lord and watch what he'll do in your life. Okay, I'm going to close with some testimonies now. As we talked about the biblical answers to prayer, we talked about how it needs to be word-centered, you need to be persistent, and you need to have faith. But I just want to share three testimonies of how God's answered prayer in my life. Um, not to boast in myself at all. Not to, so you think I'm a great prayer warrior. I actually, I want to confess before you guys, I definitely do not pray the way I know that God wants me to. Because I, I actually find it hard to pray. I find it hard sometimes to just be alone with God. I get distracted. I'm just like anyone else. My dad will probably tell you the same thing, that we both talk to each other that we need to be more in prayer in this next season because you know we get I get real busy for some reason I love to be like um, Martha and I love to go and serve and sometimes I have a hard time um, being still and praying with the Lord so I'm not saying these testimonies as if I'm some great person but I want to point you to how God is powerful to answer our prayers okay one testimony I was a, I was a younger kid and um, I really was trying to have a lot of faith and I was uh, just kind of expecting God for a miracle, okay? And um, or I w wanted to see God do something really cool. I don't know, because I, I just thought it would be cool. So I had this little Gatorade bottle, okay? And I went outside, and I had the Gatorade water bottle. And I had this little cap. The cap was so small, though. It wasn't like the orange cap. It was like the green. It was like the um, the football player cap where they have the big straw. So it was just like this tiny little cap, right, on the big straw. So it was like this small, right? And I was going to my car, and I was drinking it and it fell um, out of my mouth um, or something. I don't know exactly how it happened, but I just remember the bottle cap fell. Um, 
but I just kept on going and I, um, you know, just didn't pick it up and it, and I left the cap there and the cap, I'm telling you guys the truth. The cap was so small and so frail that if a gust of wind blew, that cap was moving. That cap was flying because it was so, it was like a leaf basically. Um, and any gust of wind was going to move that cap. And, uh, it was really windy even after that. And I remember I lost the cap and I didn't really care about the cap, but you know what I did? I started praying to God. I said, God, would you, um, would you use the wind to blow this cap back to me? Would you blow this bottle cap back to me? Because I couldn't find it the next few days, the next like four days or three days. I could not find this cap. I was looking all over in the grass. I was looking on the sidewalk. I was looking on the porch. And I realized the cap totally is like blown away. It's totally gone because of the wind. Um, and so I kept praying, God, would you blow the wind to um, bring me back this cap? And I, I don't know, I was kind of like, I was being silly with it. I didn't even feel like I really believed it, but I really wanted God to do something cool. Um, so I kept praying, God, would you blow this cap to me? And I kept checking every, every day, the sidewalk, because I was like, Lord, maybe today's the day. And I kid you not, about three days later, I come outside and the God blew the cap, the wind blew the cap right in the middle of the sidewalk, right in the stinking middle of the sidewalk, right when I came outside, like in the most obvious spot. And I just remember freaking out. I'm like, wow, God, this cap probably blew all the way down the street to the other street and you blew it back. It was the smallest little piece of plastic ever. And God literally blew it in the most obvious spot. So when I walked out the door, it was right there. And I never forgot that. I never forgot that. And maybe that's hard to understand that, but you had to be there to, to understand how small this cap was. And it was gone. I'm telling you, it was gone. I was looking everywhere for it, but I asked God to blow it back and he blew it back. So, so God can, can do crazy things, right? I've had many testimonies too of, um, you can actually ask my parents. I, for some reason, I, when I pray to find things, I find them a lot. Like God helps me find things. It's, it's kind of crazy. Like like in the craziest places, like I'll just hear a thought in my heart, like check in the back trunk and I'll like look in there and something will be there. Like, it's really cool. Not all the time, but there's, there's been a lot of times where God has like, uh, helped me find things that were really cool. Another testimony. Um, a few years ago, my truck broke down. Okay. I didn't have a truck and, um, <coughs> my landscaping business, uh, was something I was really invested in. I didn't have, um, a truck. And I didn't have the money to buy a new truck. So I actually did a fast and prayer for three days. And I prayed for God that he would provide for me a truck because I wanted to keep on landscaping so I could, you know, make money and be able to go to college and, and pay off school and all these things. So I prayed for God to, you know, provide for me a new truck. I didn't know how it was going to happen because I had no money. And so I fasted and prayed for three days. And on the third day, um, I get a, I get a call from my friend Joe and Joe said, Hey, somehow he heard about the truck situation and he said yeah god already put it on my heart like a week ago to give someone a truck and when i heard your story i knew that god that you were the one i was supposed to give it to so he said i want to send you my truck from louisiana okay i want to send you my truck from louisiana and i'm going to send it like tomorrow and he was he paid he paid the money for to have this truck shipped to me so i got a brand I mean, it wasn't new. It wasn't a new truck, but it was new to me. I got a, I got a truck for free, basically, from Louisiana after three days of praying in the craziest way because God already put on his heart to give someone a truck. At the exact same time, my truck broke down. At the exact same time, I was praying, and I didn't even tell him. Somehow, he just heard through someone else, like in a, in a side comment. Maybe my, I think he was maybe at church, and my mom mentioned it. Like, I don't even think she was expecting anyone to help but she just mentioned it like to the side um she's like oh yeah jesse's truck just broke and like she wasn't like trying to tell everyone to give me a truck or something she was just mentioning it like a side comment and so he heard it and god answered that prayer through him and the truck i'm telling you it's a miracle truck because because the truck you know it's it was kind of on its last leg even when i got when i got it there was there was some problems with it but for some reason, it, it keeps going. It keeps, I keep on thinking it's going to break down, but it doesn't. It's just living on a prayer. This truck is living on a prayer. I've been using it for four to five years and I've been able to pay off um, and, and pay through college because of my landscaping business, because of the truck that God sent me when I had no money. 
And it's a testimony. Every time I get in a truck, I remember God sent me this truck. This is not my truck. This is God's truck. And it's really cool. So, so God, you know, he did something awesome with the truck. And, um, you know, when you pray, God answers. Last testimony I'll share. I was praying and I was really desperate uh, for what college to go to. Before I went to Karen, there was three colleges I was looking at. I was looking at Liberty. I was looking at this program um, that was like a traveling program. And I was looking at Karen. And I boiled it down between Liberty and this traveling program. And it was called One Life. And um, I almost went to One Life. And I remember praying. And um, I, I did not hear clearly what to do and I remember I was worship I would go and worship and pray like sometimes for hours and cry out to God because I really wanted God to show me what college to go to I really wanted him to like show me a sign and make it clear because I really wanted to go to the college God wanted me to because at that point I was really like I was really like wanting to obey God for a big decision you know it's a big decision what college to go to and I wanted to kind of have like a sign right I'm not saying that you need a sign to pick a college or you need a sign for stuff because Sometimes God doesn't give us a sign. He just says, go by wisdom. And that's actually the main way God works is by wisdom, not by signs. So also be cautious before you always look for signs. That's something I've learned. But I do believe God can speak through sign. So, but just don't be over obsessed with signs because you can misread things. And I've done that too. But I remember praying and I said, God, would you show me a sign? And so I go to gym class and I have to make the phone call with this guy from One Life, whether I'm going to do One Life or Karen. I have to decide today and I still don't have an answer. And so I remember I was in gym class and um, I was fasting and praying again in gym class. I was at school in the first period. And I remember just realizing I have to make this phone call later and I have to decide. So I got on my knees in the gym class in the locker room and I just prayed a quick, it was the shortest little prayer. I said, God, would you just make it so abundantly clear in whatever way you want, would you just show me a sign? And would you allow me to just like see something that says Karen on it? at school today and maybe I'll know that it's you if you show me something that says Karen like I, I asked God specifically to show me something that said Karen on it if I would supposed to go to Karen uh, or or the other school I was like would you just like literally make it like so obvious that I couldn't deny it so I leave that gym class okay I'm on my way to science class okay I was getting ready to go to science but the weird thing is we're all standing outside the door okay that's kind of crazy because we usually just Every day we just walk in the class and sit down. But the teacher was in the bathroom. So as the teacher was in the bathroom, we had to wait for the teacher to get in. So we're standing outside in the hallway. And we're standing outside in the hallway. And then just like 10 seconds later, as we're standing out there, this little girl walks by going to her class. She walks by and I was looking down. I remember I looked up and I saw this girl walking by right in front of all of us. And her shirt says, Karen university it was a karen university t-shirt and i remember seeing that shirt and i almost just wept right right there because i literally just prayed for god to send me something that said karen on it if i was supposed to go and all of a sudden god god allowed the teacher to be in the bathroom for the first time i ever remember experiencing so that i would wait in the hallway a few extra seconds so that she would pass by me with this shirt on so that i would know and be able to to have peace about the college so i knew right then that that's where i was supposed to go and i look back on my years at karen i realized like that's where god wanted me to go and the craziest thing about that testimony is that i go to i went to mainland okay mainland high school is a public school if i didn't even think anyone at that school even knew what karen university was okay it is not it is a small Christian school, a very small Christian school, uh, compared to a lot of other Christian schools. And for someone that I've never seen before in my life, I never even knew this girl like went to our school, to walk by with that shirt on. I've never, I never see people wear that shirt. I've never seen people since wear that shirt at my school. Like it was the, you know, it was just, it's so crazy to see that shirt in a, in a public school, you know? So I was just, I just tell you those testimonies to say, look, God answers prayer, you know, in, in some crazy ways. Like maybe it's something as little as like a bottle cap, like you finding a bottle cap. Maybe it's as big as God showing you what school to go to. Maybe it's something big or something small. But I just want to encourage you with those testimonies because testimonies help build faith as well. Because when you hear testimonies, you are like, wow, God's actually, he's really working. 
And so I, I share that to encourage you to keep, to just stir you up, say, keep on praying, guys. And, and those testimonies remind me of times when God's worked in my past so that I can say, God, I want to see you, I want to see you answer prayers in my future. In 2024, I want to, I want to have more testimonies of being able to say, look, the Lord showed up. The Lord showed up. When I called upon him, he answered me. I could share another testimony of, um, cause I'm just thinking about it. I almost died like a couple weeks ago. And I'm not even saying that as a joke or, or exaggeration. I was driving on the highway. Someone cut me off and I went around them and my car on the highway, um, it skid out and went completely sideways and then somehow twisted back in. I was going like 65 miles per hour. Someone cut me off. I turned right away to get out of them and my car is skidding out on a crowded highway sideways <coughs> like going full speed and I thought the car was going to flip and all of a sudden I, God took over the wheel well I mean I, st I still had the wheel but I believe it was the Lord because the way that my car was and the fast speed I was going for my car to be sideways like almost completely parallel on a crowded highway and not get hit not get a scratch and it turned right back God turned it right back and I was able to keep going straight I believe that was an angel or something because I really thought I was going to get super injured or die in that moment. But guys, there's times where God protects us. There's times where God is doing things behind the scenes. We live in a spiritual realm. This physical realm is not all there is. There's a spiritual realm. And we have to connect to our creator because he's real. He's active. He's resurrected. Jesus died. He resurrected. He shed his blood so that we would have access to him through prayer. That we would have a, a boldness that we could approach him because he died on the cross for us not just to get us to heaven, but also that we would just be able to know him here on earth as well. We can build our relationship with him. So I just wanted to share that with you guys. God bless. Remember, the three keys are being word-centered, uh, being persistent, and praying with faith. So have a great uh, weekend. Happy Friday. God bless.